Ben, I really appreciate you joining me today. How have you been? It's my absolute pleasure, first of all, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm very well. Yeah, we've just um, just come back from a, a lovely walk, uh, autumnal walk in the Cotswolds, and uh, yeah, having a nice day. Thank you very much. See, I guess you couldn't ask for much better. I mean, every everywhere else is going crazy, going in lockdown, and you're in this it's like yeah. picturesque wonderland. Yeah, and it's still lockdown, but at least we have you know lots of natural beauty on our doorstep. So. We actually went to Blenheim Palace for the first time today, which is an absolutely ridiculous place I've ever been to. And it was, it was great, yeah. <laughs> nice. See, meanwhile, for me, I'm sitting at home with my wife and my cat all day, every day, which you know, I, I can't yeah. complain about, but I wish we had somewhere a little nicer to walk to. You no, know, it's fine to do nothing when you choose to do nothing. But when you're told you can do nothing, you're like, well, I want to do things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the problem, right? Well, and so, and speaking of doing things, I see that you've been very busy composing. So recently, your feature film Hosts just came out, and I know mm -hmm. you have like maybe another three, four, five, six things coming out on the horizon. Um, yeah. So let's let's uh, jump into a few of those. Yes, so first, it. with with Hosts, um, how did how did that come about? Okay, well, that's interesting because. I've actually been really good friends with um, one of the directors, Richard Oates, for um, a long time, going back to when I wasn't composing and I was just in a band. He used to make, and still does make, um, very, very good music videos for bands. Um, and he, but he'd always wanted to do film. And we've been friends, and he decided to make his first short film. Um, this is back in like 2015-ish. Um, so he wrote a film called Exit Plan, like a 20 minute little sci-fi movie. Um, and he needed a composer and I was literally the only one he knew that did cinematic music to so ask me to do it. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, man. Like, no worries. That's on YouTube, by the way, if you want to check it out, just look up. I'll, I'll, I'll throw the link up. Exit Plan short film. Um, and then um, he's basically just been, I'll be the person he works with until the end, basically. We're, we've been very, very good friends for a long time. Um, and, you know, sometimes you meet someone along the path of your, you know, journey in a creative world and you meet someone that you know is going to go on to do some really good stuff. Um, and that's the person or people you meet along the way that you need to latch onto and make sure that you continually do your best work with as well as best as you can, because if they're going to go up, they're going to take you with them. And that's that's what you need. But I've always always tried to repay the favor because he was. I actually got him his first in as a DOP, so started getting him in touch with lots more directors and working with other people. So we've, we've had that relationship for a while where I'll try and get him work and he'll always try and get me work with people he's working with. And it's always been a, just a, a nice, friendly little leg up for each other whenever we can. Nice. So how's, how's the, uh, the relationship between the two of you work? I mean, when, uh, when you're composing and his kind of comments come back? He's um, he's a unique person to work with because he um, actually studied music um, production uh, at university, so he knows what he's talking about. But he just he just can't do it. Like he can't write the music or do you know film score stuff. But he knows what he wants, um, but can't always talk about it in a way that he can actually portray what he's looking for, which is understandable. It's, that's our job is to decode the things that people say and work out what they actually mean. Um, but he, we've, we've evolved over the time. So he's very um, precious, obviously, as you would be about like, he knows what he wants and he wants to make sure that that, that happens. Um, so to start with, he found it a bit more difficult to just sort of let me go and do what I, my instinctive thing to do is. Um, but then after a while of working together, he's got a lot used to, and actually now wants to step back and just be like, I want you to just do like whatever you think is right um and then we can talk about it afterwards so that's very freeing um but I'll, I'll always normally at the start of a project right before they've started filming which is what i did with hosts um i write a few demos anyway because i want to try and um like tap into what the sound of whatever i'm going to be working on is so that when so first they so they can be excited about the fact that that's been achieved and they have, don't have to worry about like the music so much anymore because once you've found sort of what the musical landscape of a film is going to be that's almost like the hardest part i think like once you've established those key elements then you can write the music with that do you know what i mean 
Um, but he also likes to be really hands-on. So we had to shoot the film in two parts because um, we needed the right weather to shoot outside because it's set around Christmas time. Um, so for the last sort of half an hour of the film, I actually moved my studio into his house and, and he sort of sat with me. He would be working on something in the background, editing or visual effects, that kind of stuff. And I'd be writing and he'd just be listening and, and would, when I'd get to the end of a thing I was trying to get out of my brain, he'd tell me what he thought. Um, but it's always been really, really easy with him because he knows what he's looking for and I understand it and it, it just it just happens really naturally. Interesting. And mm. I mean, so first off, that actually just sounds like a really good relationship. I think sometimes it can be a little too hands off and you know, the, the end product ends up being something that the director is not quite looking for. And other times it is, you know, a little too hands on. Um, so that seems like a nice balance. And obviously having seen hosts, you know, it, it, it turned out well. Um, but one thing I did want to ask as well, before we kind of get more into the specifics of the film and mm -hmm. first hosts is to put it very simply it's a like horror almost supernaturalish home invasion movie I guess you could call it I think yeah. that's that's boiling it down a little too much but I think you could add the word drama in there I think it's yeah, uh, yeah there's definitely a family drama element yeah like it's not um it's not a cheap thrills horror movie by any stretch of imagination it's not um it's not designed to elicit the jump scare you know it's, that's not the end goal right um so it's it's got some other layers going on which i think makes it interesting as well no absolutely um, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that as well um but one thing that you mentioned to me before i had watched it um was that you wanted to kind of with the score you wanted to do some things that you hadn't heard in horror before, mm. which I think it, it begs two questions, at least two questions came to mind for me, was what are some of the things that you find common in horror music that you kind of wanted to get away from? And then what was your thought process in doing things that you haven't heard? Yeah, I think, and it, it goes with, I think, a lot of different kinds of genres of films. I think you can look at a genre and be like, well, my next job is to write, um, you know, a, a plucky, um, funny comedy movie. Then I'm just going to write like lots of like pixicato and silly little musical motifs that will be, and that's like, and I'll be like, right, well, I'll do that because that's what you do when you write comedy. Or you look at horror and you think, well, there'll be some really horrific sounding strings and lots of weird stuff and textures that have been created using strings and there'll be big string impacts for jump scares. And I mean, I don't want to shit on what the work that people do in horror because obviously there's a lot of really good stuff, but we watched like 40 movies in, in horror over Halloween period. Um, and I just, sometimes I find it a little uninspiring. Like I find, I don't, I don't ever get caught out by the music as like a, an emotional tool. I find it's it's more often used as a tool to add fear and to create fear, but not to do the some of the other emotional points in films within horror. And I wanted to move away from that and try and make everything in the score for the host emotionally driven and not driven by trying to scare people. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and I think there's... But I guess one way you can look at it is is the the layers that it, it works on a functional basis. And I mm -hmm. think quite often you get music that it's it's okay, this is an action sequence, so this needs to just be kind of pounding and relentless to build the action. Mm -hmm. And it it kind of does that on the surface level in the very kind of obvious ways. But and and I'm I'm stealing from a composer interview I listened to a couple of days ago, and I can't remember the composer, it was on a panel, but he was saying where, you know, in a, in a chase sequence, that's normally what you hear, but then you, you have to take into account, like, there are characters in the chase, and so maybe you want to also include the, you know, their internal responses, or what's going on in their heads, or what's led them to these points, and that's where you get these more kind of dynamic or deeper yeah. scores that aren't just here's what's 
what's going on and like yeah. on the literal surface level and we're going to replicate that so i i think it i think that does make sense that, that person sounds like he thinks in the same way that i do i'm not thinking about necessarily always just what you're seeing i'm trying to write from the perspective of the person or characters that are involved in the situation yeah and i think it might have been it might have been uh, harry manfredini or one other like classic horror composer so i mean that's you know, if you're if you guys are thinking the same way it's a good company to be in yeah i'm, I'm fine with that yeah <laughs> I, mean, I, feel, I feel bad like i don't think that horror scores are bad i think they add a lot to horror like my mum would always say you know when she watches alien i can watch it if i turned the sound off because the music freaks her out so much that it's that's what's making her so scared which is amazing because that's the job right the music is super helpful in doing that but it's, it would be the same with any genre. I would, I don't want to do what people do or have done already. So I didn't listen to any horror scores. We didn't use any horror scores as reference material. We'd had no temp music or anything like that. And I know the next time I get a film and I, whatever genre or whatever the topic is, I'm not going to research any films like it. I'm just going to do what feels right to me. You know, that's, that's what I want to do. I don't want to fit a mold. I guess I want to try to carve my own path. Yeah. So were you, did you listen to anything specifically for the film or was it just, you know, you just went in kind of raw almost to do it? Yeah, just straight raw. Like just, <laughs> that's terrible. Um, <laughs> like we always have a lot of conversations in advance about, because we hang out all the time. We're, we're always in the pub. Um, I used to live down the road from him. So would always be talking about what he's going to be working on and what's going to be coming up way in advance of, of, of actually it happening. So I, I start building these pictures of what I want to try and do um, based on the descriptions of what the characters are like and how they come to be and the dynamic between the family. And then, then I just, I need to just get that out somehow. So then I just start exploring the musical landscape and hope that when I send them the first few demos over that that's kind of what they thought too. Interesting. Hmm. And so one of the things that kind of surprised me with the score, or, or maybe I'd say it caught me off guard a little bit, especially when I was listening to it before watching the film, uh, because at that point I didn't know what the film was about and I didn't know the setting. I didn't know it was set at uh, Christmas. Yeah. So there's... That makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's around halfway through, maybe a third of the way through the, the film and the score, there's a, you kind of do a rendition of the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I'm not going to give away any plot points, but it, it comes sort of after a, a horrific sequence. So there's, there's, a, there's a good juxtaposition between what happened on screen and what your, I, I guess the, the feelings that that song normally elicits yeah. um but it's also the renditions also in this just really almost like out of tune kind of bizarre way it, it reminded me of i don't know if you've um, ever heard of the um, music project the caretaker i'm not no um i mean it's so i i recommend looking it up it's it's just this this brilliant project and the the main project that he had done is it's, I don't know, maybe it's like 150 tracks that are meant to um, basically track someone falling into the depths of dementia. And it's, you know, been released over years. But it it has that similarity where you have music that sounds familiar, and it just sort of like slowly gets degraded. And, and so I, I love the project. So hearing that it drew some similarities in kind of the, the broader sense of it. And I thought it was just so interesting because it takes what you're used to and just really makes it awful in yeah. obviously in a good way. I know. I, know. I mean, honestly, like I, I actually wrote that and came up with the idea for it before I'd seen it. So I did like four or five demos and that was one of the demos. Cause I always had this idea cause we, we spoke about the fact that they would, um, they're meant to be like, you know, relatively well off family. And I had this idea that they would have like um like a record player in their house and that they listen to like classical music and um like around Christmas time they have this record. And like when they're 
in the house, like when they're cooking and stuff, you can hear other renditions that I've done that are way less messed up. They're just kind of normal sounding, but it still has the same tone. So I ran it all through um, like a vinyl um, replication plugin um, that had, so I could add things like warping. So it would like bend in and out of tune. Um, I could add like um, artifacts like dust and the needle quality and all that kind of stuff to make it sound really not normal. Um, but I just ramped it up when I came to um, that particular track. Um, and then obviously it it stay it, it does maintain as the original track all the way through, but I add a lot of elements on top to to make you feel like it it could very easily be something completely different. Um, but yeah, and I only did it because I thought it would be funny. Um, like I just found the idea hilarious. Like you've just seen probably one of the most horrendous deaths in a film you'll see for a long time. And I thought it's Christmas. How horrendously disgusting would it be if we use such a nice piece of music and just after that and just make it the most horrendous and uncomfortable listening experience possible you know it it worked i part of he's a little upset that i'd listened to the score so i knew that it was going to come at some point and you you told me it followed something horrendous but i can imagine you know just watching it and having it come in just how much of a kind of a punch that would be because yes. that whole that yeah, whole yeah. after the moment happens that that whole piece of music that plays out everything that's going on during that is still really not very nice yeah know? i mean yeah you're you're sitting in you're basically sitting in the fallout of yeah. what's happened with the family and and yeah that's that's playing over top and and i think that's a good way to put it it's almost in a like a mocking manner as well yeah yeah. So yeah, I I thought that was interesting, and and you mentioned too how beforehand you do hear um, renditions Other. of that song, yeah. and and yeah, I I thought that was that was interesting. It it sets the tone well. To me, it almost felt like a because it's it's pushed down a lot farther in the mix than most yeah. of the other music. So it felt almost like a kind of like a holiday music in a way. Um, yeah, like they've just got yeah. some like, dodgy vinyl from a market somewhere of some guy playing piano versions of Christmas tracks, and they've just got it on in the house somewhere. And you notice it, but you don't listen to it, but you know it's playing, so that when it happens in in the film, when you hear this particular piece of music, you feel like, oh, well, that would happen, because we've heard some stuff before anyway. But we didn't have the time to, like, or the budget or anything like that to build in this idea of that they're actually being a record player there and get shots of it and stuff, because... Like we shot the film in like eleven days. Wow. Um, eleven days for like a twenty thousand pound budget. <laughs> so we made it for nothing. You know, the crew was like twenty of us. I was on set every day, so I also did uh, script supervision um, and like helping out on set. I was there every day, and then we go home and like write little ideas for things I've seen. And yeah, it was super all hands on deck. So, and I know that you've done a lot of shorts, and I think that was the the third feature that you'd done right did you did you notice a a benefit or any sort of difference in being on set all the time i i've i've spoken to him a lot about it that's the first film i've worked on set um and i've i will be gunning to work on set in a, in some capacity with every film i ever do moving forwards like i i really enjoy um script supervision um like i've got quite an eye for detail anyway um or they can call it like continuity manager or whatever they want to call it. Um, but I find it really useful because, well, first of all, you get to actually be a part of the experience and hang out with all the cast and crew and actually feel like part of the the team, which I always felt like I'd missed because I'm always, you know, the musicians are the last people to really get involved. Um, and I just felt like I wasn't really feeling like I was part of the team and I wanted to be more involved with the process. Um, and I think seeing things unravel and being on set and really getting to know the script inside out. Cause I don't I mean, I'll normally read the script and then I'll get the film and then just start working, but actually seeing it all come to life and seeing the shots, you know, in the, whatever they call it, the screens. Um, it's, it just, I don't know if it's like obvious, but it definitely adds some kind of level of knowledge and, and like, even if it's just subtle, like it's just like a, oh, I'm, I think I'm doing the right thing because you're kind of seeing it, 
So like, you know that your ideas are probably going on the right path that's sort of matching what the visuals that you've been imagining are. So I do think subconsciously, if anything, it, it certainly helps and it adds a lot of um, like confidence and um, help. It just helps to inspire as well. Like when you're seeing these shots take place and dialogue seems to happen, you're like, oh, I think I've got an idea for what I could do with these scenes when I actually get it. And you might, t I take a little note or something like what I might want to do or a feeling I have. And, and then hopefully it translates when you actually get the edit. But I, I think it's super useful. And I, I'll be gunning to work on set in, in any film I ever do. See, I, I find that really fascinating because I think top to bottom, every composer I've talked to basically is never on set. They just sometimes look at the script in advance, but generally they just get it at the end of the day and you know start working when everything else is wrapped. So I think that's really cool to hear how beneficial it is I because, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think most people necessarily think of how whether it would be helpful or not. True. And I just think like, I could be like just a composer, you know, or I could just write music, you know, one way or another. It wouldn't doesn't necessarily need to be film. But, like, I've chosen it that my my the goal and what I love to do is to write music for film. So the more involved in film that I can be because I love film, the better because I want to learn. I'm fascinated about how films get made. I love hanging out in different departments and um, learning about how they capture on set sound. And I helped out with some boom op stuff from the second shoot that we did, um, helping out in like, like all the like special effects stuff with like onset blood. And I love all that stuff. Like, I want to learn everything. Like how are we doing all this stuff? Um, I just want to absorb as much information as possible. Um, and it's just, it's just cool. You know, it's like all these guys are working on a film for like a year. And then I come along, like plonk some notes and I write some music and then and that's that. But I, I like to be involved during that whole year that they're working on it, you know, providing I'm not working on anything else, you know, I mean, a shoot really is only like, you know, a couple of weeks, a month, two months, whatever, right? So I can um, hopefully continue to manage to build time where I can be on set because I don't want to just hang out. I want to work, you know, I want to be on set working, doing a specific function that also adds value to the project alongside the value that that will later add when I come to write music, you know? Interesting. Yeah, and and I think it it would give you kind of a more immersed experience with the film. You're not you're not getting it at the end of the day. You've been with it almost from day one, mm. and are working so intimately with it. Particularly when you're doing script supervision too. You're you're in the actual like literal letters of the film. So yes. yeah, I I get that. And and look at the same time, I understand why. I think a lot of uh, film composers don't want to do that. They they do music and and like that's what they're happy with and comfortable with. I get that as well. You know, I think it's you know different strokes for different folks, right? Um, people are very happy in their studios writing music and they want to do that and that's their primary focus and and it is for me as well. That's where I inevitably want to end up being. But I just really enjoy the, the other side of the process too, and I just find it also fascinating. You know. Yeah. Well, and I've, I, I've uh, very briefly dabbled in other as like in aspects of the the filmmaking process of what feels like another life ago, and yeah, I've I've always found it fascinating. So I I totally get where you're coming from. Um, you know, whether it's like writing a script, being an extra, doing whatever. I just think it's it's such a, a cool and utterly complicated process that most people who are who are sitting in front of the TV screen of the the theater screen don't necessarily realize yeah and also uh, if you are a young and up-and-coming composer listening to this and you're wondering how to meet more people to find new connections who will inevitably end up recommending you to hopefully get more work then being on set meeting all the crews that will ultimately go on to work on other projects with other directors if they're on your team and they're going on new sets and saying to the director, or oh, I've just worked with this guy. He did a really good job on the film. Um, I met him on set. Then you know you're going to start building up your network of people, which is another one of the reasons that I like to get on set because I'm proactively trying to get more work. I'm not some guy who's living a life of luxury, getting paid mega bucks to you know to write music for films. I still have to hustle and think about ways to market and get myself more exposure. Um, and it's lucky that I love 
being on set, but it's definitely adds a lot of value in terms of creating new opportunities down the line as well. That's, I think that's great advice. And, and not just that too, you never know who in a, I don't want to call it like a secondary position, but someone who's not the director, what they'll end up doing. You know, there, there are so many instances where someone does, you know, maybe they're a second unit director, they do makeup, they do whatever else in, in the production side, and then they go and end up in a different position. They end up directing you know, the, I, I should have a more recent example on, on <laughs> hand, but I know like the, the guy that directed Halloween three was originally, I think the makeup artist in Hollywood one and two. So, right. you know, just, you, you never know who's going to do what. Yeah. And you know, if it's, if you're up for it and you want to make a go of it, then nothing is a bad idea, right? Yeah. Why not? Um, so I am, I do want to ask a couple questions more about coasts and then we can, oh, yeah, we can, great. uh, change directions. One of the other things that I found really interesting in hosts is it has, it, it largely has the same, um, kind of sonic palette throughout barring a couple of those, um, you know, just total changes like the, the sugar plum fairy, the, the end credits track as well is quite different, but there were a few sounds within that, that I found really interesting. And one of them is, you, and you might hear it throughout, but the time that I really noticed it was, um, in the garden sequence near the beginning, there's this kind of light, almost kind of like raspy sounding drum effect. And, and I was just wondering, where do you, you know, it's, it's one thing getting the general palette, but I mean, how do you decide which actual sounds or instruments to use, especially in something that's quite complex and layered? Yeah. Well, I think, um, experimentation, I think, um, my start, my normal starting point is I don't have a pre-built, um, template, for example. So every new project, I'll build a template from scratch and we'll just add everything I think could be useful at some point. Um, and then we'll add or remove things as I'm going along. If I'm not using something, I'll get rid of it. But if I need something or something pops up in my, that could be cool, then I'll add it. Um, I think that's a really important starting point for me is not opening up, you know, mega template one and starting from there because I know I'm going to do the same things again. Um, so I always try and find the, the sources of inspiration for the project from scratch. Cause there's, you know, well, for one, you know, I'm, I'm limited, right? I don't have a thousand synths in the background. You know, I'm an, in a position where as much as I don't love it right now, I'm in the box, you know, everything's in the computer. It's all sample libraries. Um, but that doesn't mean that I have to use them as intended, you know? So I might find a cool sound and then, um, process it and manipulate it into it sounding not how it should. And that sounds really interesting. And even if it's just a subtle texture, it's something that is ultimately adding, but at, at the end of the day, it's always that fine balance between, I never want there to be too much. Um, so I always need to rein in where the line is. Like when, I, when do you know a, a, a thing you're writing is done? Because you never really know, right? You can just keep going and adding and adding. Um, but I've, I'm always quite strict on myself and always try not to overwrite and not to overcomplicate. Um, my, I always see my job as being serving what you see and what people are feeling, not my own musical interest. Um, does that make sense? So I'm not trying to show off or do anything that makes me look cool or clever. I just want it to be what feels necessary, I guess would be my, the way I make my decisions. Um, so that's just one of those sounds that I found in a little obscure percussion library that I had and just messed it up a bit, basically. <laughs> well, that approach does make sense. I mean, and, and I've, I've said this to some people in the past, but you know, 
your your role as the composer obviously is first and foremost making something that's going to work in the film and enhance the film and like if it if it does make you look clever if it does end up being an an, an iconic sound or theme or something like that's great but how it works in context is the most important yeah absolutely i 100 percent agree with that that sentiment yeah yeah well i i wish i could take credit for it but i can't come on maybe you said that at some point in the past right <laughs> um so i am curious then because you aren't listening to music while you're scoring so at least you're not listening to music for the purpose of getting inspiration for it yeah what what inspired you in the first place to get into film music um i mean my dad listened to and i had listened to by being in the same vicinity as of him quite a lot of classical music when I was growing up. So I always really enjoyed classical music. Um, and then I went away from that and started a, a metal band and was all about heavy music. And I wrote a lot of music in a, in a band that did fairly well, you know. Um, and it wasn't until I was maybe like 19, 20 that I sort of redis that discovered that film music even really existed, I guess. Like I wasn't listening to it when I was young. Um, and I don't know why, but I think it might, it might've been gladiator. I, I, I watched gladiator when I was really young. I'm just, I think I felt very moved by it and established that it was probably because of the music at certain points. Um, and then listened to the score. And that was, I probably think was the first score I ever really like listened to instead of, um, you know, hearing in passing whilst it's happening. Like jaws, for example, obviously scared me when I was really young because, um, I broke my leg when I was like five and the hospital I was in, like had it on a TV <laughs> in front of my bed and like, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't turn it off. I was just like there, like looking at it and it, yeah, it messed me up. Um, so that obviously contributed a lot, but I had never listened to a score until I think gladiator. Um, and then I was like, Oh wait, like, so you're telling me like, I could write like kind of classical music, but it's like for films and it's not like, I haven't got like any rules really I need to follow. I can, it can be kind of cool. It can be like rock and it can have riffs and I can do all sorts of stuff in, in film music. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get logic. And cause I had logic cause I just got it. Cause I was demoing song bands by like bands for the song. What songs for the band. And then it had all these terrible MIDI samples in there. So I was just started dabbling and it all elevated from there. Interesting. And it's it's so funny how just those little moments can be so inspiring. I will say I, I do love the idea of or the, the image that I have in my head of you like strapped in a bed as a five year old being traumatized. It just reminds me of like, Malcolm McDowell and a Clockwork Orange. Yeah, I have nightmares about it still. <laughs> it's always it's the same reoccurring dream. And it's always that I'm on the edge of the swimming pool and the swimming pool has sharks in for some reason. But the, and then I'm being forced into the pool by a big digger just driving towards me and I can't move. I can't do anything but go in the water. I don't know, man. With <laughs> real insight into my subconscious there for you guys. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to transition this into a, you know, a therapy <laughs> podcast. Therapy <instead>. now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll imagine then, obviously, with, with Gladiator, you know, Hans Zimmer then is a, a composer that at least has had some impact on you are there any other you know whether it be classical composers or more um contemporary film or yeah. otherwise composers think, yeah, that have impacted you i certainly have hans zimmer to thank for that sort of big introduction to film music um because he went on and did some films that were when i was growing up um i can't think of a fancy word but they were important like when i saw inception for example i was like oh geez like that's doing something that i didn't that i've not heard film music do before which was obviously super cool um my dad um gave me cd copies of handel's messiah um mozart's requiem and the Vivaldi's four seasons so those three have always been really important to me um but then sort of more recently i've always um 
I've always loved, and it's a quite an obscure one, I think. Um, do you know, have you seen the film Seven Pounds with Will Smith? Yeah. It's the most depressing film ever. Um, but Angelo Mealy, the score he wrote for that is just the most beautiful thing. Um, and despite my main history of writing music um, being normally quite dread-filled, um, I absolutely love writing and listening to sombre emotional music because I just find it like the, the ability for someone to write music that invokes such a pure reaction of sadness, I think is just the most pure thing that you can do to somebody else musically. Um, I've always been fascinated with it. So I, I love writing um, music for drama and like really heightened emotional music I've always really enjoyed. So I've got a lot to thank for Andrew Amelia as well. I think he's amazing. Interesting. I don't think I've ever actually listened, like listened to the score. So I'll probably, I'll do that soon. Um, I mean, that, that is one of the things that I find so fascinating with, with music generally, but also, you know, when you really dissect film sometimes with film music as well, is, is how it can really hit those emotions. And, and like you said about Alien earlier, where without it, it may have some sort of impact, but when you add the music in, it just amplifies things tenfold. And the ability to do that is... I don't know. It's it's. I think to a to a listener sometimes or a viewer, it it almost feels like magic. Like you're you're hitting you know the the right tone and note combination that you know just makes someone cry or puts someone into fear or you know anger or it gets their heart pounding. Yeah, totally. And I always think like, you know, it's good when you couldn't imagine there being anything else there in its replacement. You know, when. And it doesn't necessarily mean to need to be like um, sort of the, the theme. It can just be like just the sound of the film, like um, like Gravity, for example, by Stephen Price, right? That score is insane. And it couldn't be anything else, in my opinion. Like the way that he approached it and what he did, that is the sound that is Gravity to me. I don't think anyone else could have done it. So it has to be him. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, That's it, it, it totally like, does. That, that you get... If when it's done right, it's the only thing that could ever be on that film. So if you replace it with something else, it couldn't work. I love so, that. Do you ever do you ever try um, rescoring pieces like scenes from <laughs> from uh, films or shows or things like that that do it my don't have that that perfect score? No, I've not done that. I've I've done things like that in the past where. I've loved something so much that I've tried to do my own version of it. Like, um, I think the first, one of the first things I ever, like, I'm not gonna say released, because I don't think when you're writing music for the first time you release music, it's just music is available or not. Um, but I, I did like my own version of the Seven Pounds trailer. So like I rescored the trailer, um, but in the style of Angelo Mealy. And I found like, that was a really, I've always found that as like an interesting learning experience. Is, um, I wouldn't. I don't know if you call it imitation, but recreation. Like, how do they make that sound? Like, how did they write that phrase? Like, and working out like how it all goes together. Because I'm not musically trained. I'm. I'm solely use my ears. So, I find it really fascinating to like listen. So, like when I recreated the Star Wars trailer, for example, and I did it on on my Twitch channel, I just listened like intently. And I can like separate the layers and hear like, oh, there's a brass line doing this here. And then I can play it in. And I, I just love like piecing it all together and, and seeing like, oh, right. So that's how they do that. And like, I, it's just, I find it all fascinating, man. That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> See, me, you know, meanwhile, for me, I, I very briefly was able to read music a decade ago and that's it. So it's all, you know, whether, whether you do it by ear or can read it, it's all magic for me. But... Oh, you're 100% right. I, I think people who are trained and musically educated are wizards, man. I don't understand. Like, I actually, on my first feature, I had an assistant because he wanted like a, um, this was Invasion Planet Earth, the film. The guy wanted like a proper score, man, like a proper, like, you know, throwback 70s style um, thematic score. And I was like, well, oh, boy, <laughs> I don't know if I can do that, but I'm going to say yes anyway. Um, so I got myself an assistant um, that I met um, 
who was studying at Birmingham Conservatoire, like a fancy Birmingham music school. Um, his name's Peter, he's a legend. And I was like, I need you, bud, because I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm gonna write all this music, right? And can you come down and like, make sure that it makes sense? <laughs> because I'm like scared that I'm not gonna do a good enough job. But basically I would just write all these pieces of music and he would come along afterwards and, you know, cause samples will let you do things that maybe wouldn't normally happen in an orchestra. So he would come in and be like, right, well, that violin line you've written would probably be more realistic and, and would sound nice if you put it on a viola. I'm like, okay, cool. Cause like I'm using all the instruments, but maybe something would sound better in a register somewhere else and he'll help me with that. But he'll also do things like tell me what I've done that's interesting that I don't understand. <laughs> you know, like he'll be like, that chord is a whatever. And I'm like, cool, man. Like, but he'll be like impressed. I'm like, I don't know what I've done, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I love that. I'm like, that's so cool. Like, tell me what it is. Tell me what I've done. So with having that experience, then have you, have you tried to kind of learn more about, you know, uh, like music reading and music theory or just say, is it still just a point where it's like, ah, I'm just going to keep going. How, how I'm, I'm doing it. Going, you know, um, I think I would like to learn, like what my, I think my, primary thing once we get out of lockdown is to get actual piano lessons like because everything i do i do on a keyboard so if i can be proficient um like more proficient you know on the on the piano and learn a bunch of the theory of surrounding piano and music during that process then that will be very advantageous but um that's a lot just because i want to be faster um, like I'm, I'm already fast, but like I, if I'm armed with the knowledge and, and some more technical skill, like on the piano, then I'll be faster by default, right? Hopefully, um, or maybe I'll think more and that'd be a problem. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I try not to think too much. I just try and do things, you know? Well, and that's, I guess that's one of the benefits of the, the primary goal of it sounding good is if you don't if you don't have to think to make it sound good, then you're golden, right? Well, that sounds, that sounds like, uh, I, I feel like I have a God complex or something like, <laughs> obviously you have to think, but like, I don't want to think about what I'm going to do. I just want to just do and see what comes out and hope for the best. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not thinking about how and technically and from a theory standpoint, if anything I'm going to do or what I'm thinking about is going to make sense. Like if it sounds good, I'm going to do it. And hopefully it's, I mean, it can't sound, you know, if it sounds good, then it can't be wrong. Right. Yeah. Or even if it is wrong and it sounds good, then it still sounds good. I don't know, dude, do we need the rules? <laughs> but I think that's, that's sort of the beautiful things about film music as a form is it's been around since, I don't know, like the 1920s. Um, you know, with whatever uh, the the film Camille Saint-Saëns did, like in, I don't know, 1922 or something. Like, right. it's it's 100 years old. There really aren't that many rules. Like, a lot of the rules, like, a lot of the rules exist from you know, 19th century operas and, and things that are only, like, tangentially relevant. So, at this point, you're not, it's almost not breaking rules because they don't, they don't exist. People have preferences, but there's nothing set in stone. Yeah. I just want to approach it all like I'm still in the rock band, you know? I just want to just want to write some tunes and not think about too much about how I'm going to do it or the process. Just, just want to write some tunes, man. <laughs> rock out, hopefully, along the way at some point. So that that does explain the the ending track and hosts, which that's not actually me. That's so the oh, other it's not. the other director and the the writer of the film, Adam Leader, is in a band called In Search of Sun. He's a singer, um, so his band wrote the the song at the end. Oh, interesting. The my score ends when they like le when the well, I guess I can't really say my score ends when the song starts at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so that that personally makes more sense to me because it does seem um, to be a like a, a right. palette jump. 
between the score that had had come before and then that ending track. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, vastly different, vastly different. But I, I think it works really well though. I really like the, I like the way it it, it sits within that final scene. Yeah. So have you, have you then had a chance in other works you've scored or upcoming ones to kind of directly implement your rock and metal background? Yes, I have. So I'm, I'm, we're in pre-production on a film. Oh, we, we were until, I guess we are indefinitely for the moment. Um, a new film called um, A Thousand Flames. Um, and it's about um, a guy who's in a rock band who um, gets really badly injured and spends a lot of time recovering in hospital where he meets a girl who dabbles on the acoustic and they form a relationship and start writing music together. So I was hired on that job to write all the songs in the film for the band and all the acoustic tracks. And then I'm also scoring the film. So that This is the first time I've really got to sort of write songs for a film as well as um, then scoring it, which will be really interesting. But it's been really fun because the band, um, I've had total freedom to just create this identity for a band. Um, so ended up writing this sort of like, they're meant to be cocky. They're meant to not, they're meant to not be like the nicest guys. They're like arrogant and um, think they're super cool and they're not famous or anything, but they just think they're like the shit, you know? Um, so I wrote them this like Britishy sounding swaggery rock. And I had to write um, three songs, wrote all the music, wrote all the vocals, um, vocal lines, vocal melodies. I've got all the demos of me singing them and then wrote, I'd never really written lyrics before, did all that. Um, you know, had to write acoustic songs for a girl had to write the lyrics and did like the vocal demos myself, like doing all falsetto stuff. And that's been wild, dude. It's been so much fun though. Like actually getting to like write some riffs. It's been good. But then I've, I'm hoping I get to do a bit more because I've got another film that's in pre-production and they want to go super industrial with it, like mm. Nine Inch Nails vibes. Um, and again, another, a, new, a genre I've never worked in before, um, but should be super fun. I love that though, when they're like, whenever it's something I've never done before, that's so exciting because I just get to explore a whole new musical landscape. Like I know what Nine Inch Nails sounds like. I know I'm not going to listen to any of it. I'm just going to like, right, if I was going to do, set up my own industrial band, like what would it sound like? I'm just going to go wild and experiment. I, I love that. And I, I will say I'm, you know, I'm a big metal head and I won't say I'm a huge industrial fan but like i i mean, like i mean yeah but i i like industrial bands and it's not that big in the genre and i think both of those are maybe it's because of how how new the, how relatively new the genres are and how different they are from like your classic orchestral music that's normally used in film but i think mm -hmm. they're so vastly underutilized so i'm really <laughs> interested really in seeing how how those come out that's gonna be really fun because like that we want the scores to sound like industrial tracks, but I need to make it sound like film music at the same time. So I'm going to have to explore, like, how can I merge these things together? And like, am I going to use traditional orchestral sounds or am I going to use um, synths, but manipulate them into pads that sound sort of like they could be cinematic and then use them as like an orchestra of synths in some way? It's going to be wild. I can't wait. See, but part of it too is it's, again, it, it's almost asking the question of like, what does film music even sound like? I don't know if you've ever listened to um, David Lynch's score for Racerhead, but it, it's, I don't know, it's maybe 40 minutes of basically just like industrial noise. And I mean, I it, it works brilliantly because the film is very much like has this kind of industrial apocalypse feel to it right but it is it is not film music at all in the traditional sense and yet it works yeah. really well in the film and i mean i have i have uh 
some odder tastes. So I, I mean, I find it like really enjoyable to listen to on its own as well. But it's like it's the not. Thing is, like I've heard about this before, where it's um, like, where do you draw the line between what's music and what's not? I, I don't know what I was. I think it was like a YouTube video of someone like exploring these different things like is this music or is it not music like who decides is it in, is it preference is it you know is it like a does it have to have certain criteria to meet what qualifies as being music and i don't think it does you know but it also isn't for everyone right and that's the same with anything like if it for some it maybe even to me that might just sound like noise but to you it sounds like something else and that's what's interesting yeah and and I, I I love the question of what music is. This is this is a, an embarrassing story for me, but this is maybe two years ago. I I was listening to ambient music in my headphones, and I was I was doing something else. I was only like half paying attention to it, but I was really enjoying it. I was like, oh, I, you know, like I just have kind of a a random playlist on who is this band. And I I looked on my laptop, and I didn't have music playing. It was just like the sounds of my water heater just making like ambient noises for the last 20 minutes but you passively through your headphones like yeah. you could hear it in the world but you thought it was something playing yeah and like that was that was it, it had enough sound for me to think like oh this is just like experimental ambient music and you know maybe maybe that just like destroys my credibility as someone who talks about music but um... well, it does because obviously it elicited an emotional response right which you know could seem laughable you know depending on who you're asking but ultimately i mean i'm not a messiah i don't i don't know but i would say that what qualifies as being music is what elicits and if it elicits an emotional response one way or the other from somebody else right i don't know that's up to you to decide well i mean i don't know i think i at least like that definition because of how expansive it is um i mean I also just can't stand the the debates people have of just broadly disliking genres or being like, oh, this wasn't made by physical instruments. It's made in a computer. Like, that's not music. It's just, it's the, the close-mindedness is so frustrating to me, particularly cool. now where there's just so much good music made in a zillion different ways and a zillion different styles. Yeah, and you, you can't, you can't literally say that something's not music because it's been written in a computer. Like, I I could play you some music that's been written on a computer and you wouldn't know. Like, so how do you know anymore? Sampling has got so good that it does get to a point where it's going to be hard for anyone to know. So you're going to have to be pretty damn, have pretty damn good ears to know if you're being cheated out of listening to real music anymore. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And I, I don't know, it's, it's funny though, because it's a, it's a conversation that I think has been going on for a really long time, because I was watching a video with Wendy Carlos from I don't know, 50 years ago, and like she was, the, the narration was talking about how much flack she was getting for making like synthesized versions of classical songs. And it's like, who cares? Yeah, yeah. life's too short to be debating what, what is and what isn't music. Yeah, you know? but listening. you know what though, I'm of the opinion like life's too short for most of the debates people have. Like most sure. of the stuff that people really complain about, like it just doesn't matter. Just enjoy what you enjoy. Let someone else enjoy what they enjoy. Like, I agree. I agree. Um, all right, so I mean we're we're getting close to the end, but I did want to ask you, what was the what what was the style of uh, of your metal band from way back when? Okay, well, the band was called Malathis. Um, and it's the only band I've ever been in. I started, I joined the band when I was like 17. Um, and we were a bit of a mix of things and it evolved over the years because we were together 10 years. But we have like three full length albums and two EPs. Um, it's all on available on Spotify, Apple Tunes, you know, wherever you want to listen to your music. Um, but it was basically heavy metal, like thrash groove some proggy stuff you know what i would say i would go so, i wrote all the songs right so i'd go so far as to say it's pretty similar to my approach to music now right like i write i wrote metal and it was a bit of whatever i wanted you know 
I didn't want to pigeon. There was no pigeonholing us into any particular one subgenre of metal. We dabbled in it all, really. And it's the same now. Like I write film music, but you're not going to be able to limit me to writing in a particular style of film music. Hopefully, I'll always continue to push myself to write for films that are intentionally different to things I've already done. And the goal is for you to listen to it and recognize that it's me. And that's what's important. I like it. Just creating creating the identity that's you, not the specific you know tone or genre, but just... That... It's, that, that sounds like Ben, you know, yeah. that sounds like the Benjamin Simon score. And it could be, hopefully, if you listen to Invasion Planet Earth or Hosts or whatever else I do, worlds apart musically. But hopefully there's something that just makes you know that it's me. You have to let me know if I ever get there. <laughs> I, hey, I hope so. And I, I hope you also end up getting to the point where you are making the mega bucks, like you mentioned. We'll see. We are... I'm... That's not the end goal. I would like to be in a position where it's comfortable and I don't have to stress about the next thing or, you know, making the next mortgage payment or whatever. Um, but, you know, life is a, an ever evolving thing. You know, right now the film industry is kaput, so I have to evolve. So, you know, I've been lucky in the sense that I actually managed to end up writing music for YouTubers at the moment. So I've written like, 15 tracks over the last few months for um, a guy on YouTube called Internet Historian. Um, and I've been writing all sorts of stuff. He just did like an hour long feature, um, like documentary style, even though it's it's all very funny. So but it's about, it's called The Gentleman Pirate, if you want to look it up by Internet Historian. And it follows the the life story of a pirate called Steve Bonnet, who, who came to be known as the Internet, not the Internet, the Gentleman Pirate. And um, I got to write some like, ridiculous pirate music, some epic stuff. Um, I also got to write uh, like an, an 80s synth wavy kind of montage track, a la like Rocky, for when he goes on like captain, like pirate captain training, because he's a shit captain. Um, <laughs> and it's just a mess. Like I've got to write so many different styles. Um, and I think that's like important that I might not end up being a film composer. Maybe I'll end up being someone who gets paid to write music for YouTube or kids TV, or I don't know, you like, you know, but obviously it would be nice if it was film, but ultimately I want to write music for things and have a good time doing it. And if it's not film, that's okay. That's I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the internet historian because I actually, I did listen to a few of those tracks earlier today. Um, mm. on your SoundCloud, and, and it was just funny first going from hosts to that because it's it's like such an absurd genre change, especially because I think the first track you have up there is the Captain Montage, and so the I mind. went from I went from listening to like just this right. like, just bleak, dreadful music to this like upbeat, like, fun, like silly '80s synth track, and I was yeah. like, it's this is not at all what I expected. You know what, man? That's me in a nutshell. You know, like, I'm I'm not a very serious dude. You know, like, I, I can, I'm kind of an idiot. I just want to have a good time and and write music. And I I absolutely loved writing that that montage track. It was so much fun. Um, but then you know I equally love ham like holding one key down for ten minutes and making some dread. Um, this just as fun. Um, it's. You know, I just it's just a lot of fun getting to do what we do. And um you should expect that we will go from dread to talking about getting scurvy in the dick in, in the next line, you know? That's that's what I'm gonna be doing. I love it. <laughs> uh Ben, I I really appreciate you joining me today. Um good luck with all your projects going, both in features, short films, YouTube, wherever else the path is gonna take you. Thank you so much, dude. And let's um let's do a podcast in a year. And we'll see what's changed. I, I'd, I'd love it. Sounds good to me, buddy. It's been an absolute pleasure, man.